Welcome back to Glamour Unfiltered, hosted by me, Josh Smith. And today we're joined by Years and Years star, and now he's starring in It's a Sin. It's Oli Alexander. Woo, woo, woo. It's a Sin is amazing. I've seen a couple of episodes of it and it's heartbreaking. The portrayal of the AIDS and HIV epidemic in the 80s. And it's such a tricky subject matter and it's such a heavy subject matter, isn't it? So when you first got approached about this and you did the research around it, what kind of shocked you the most from your discoveries? Well, oh my gosh, so much. I mean, this is a period of history that's like very, um, there's, there's so much that you could go into and kind of discover. And what I was really struck by, um, how much misinformation and, and misunderstanding there was um, when this mysterious illness arrived in the UK, because people just had no idea what it was, where it came from, uh, what it would do, um, but something started killing people, you know, it was literally a death sentence, this, this illness. and. You know, when it first appeared, people, the, the hysteria and the panic and the fear that it, you know, created, like, you, you can't underestimate it. It's so, and it's so different to what was fascinating to me as well. It's so different to how, to now, obviously, you know, with all the information we have at our fingertips. And yet the misinformation and kind of misunderstanding is still so prevalent. And I think mm. that, that really made me go, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. Um, but there were so, so many things about this period of history that's so shocking. You know, you couldn't get... You couldn't get a mortgage if you were gay. Like people would ask you, you know, have you slept with another man? You know, you might, you, some people ask if you slept with another, if, if you've had sex with an animal, they thought that might be an indication you have this illness, you know, it's crazy. Or, uh, you know, in one case, um, you know, a boy wasn't let out, he got locked up because people didn't want to go near him or go near this potential virus. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, there's a lot that, that, that's just like, and it really wasn't that long ago, you know. Also, the weird thing is when you watch it, you then think about the COVID-19 outbreak and how <laughs> you then think about that in the same context. You're like, well, the government didn't actually do anything to help the AIDS and HIV victims in that situation. And so it almost makes it more tragic when you're looking at it and watching it during a pandemic as well. Do you find that? I couldn't believe, you know, we finished filming before, the pandemic started but I couldn't believe the parallels that were you know that, that are there and yeah I, I think it's, it's hugely heartbreaking to, to think you know it, it's, it took decades for effective treatment for people living with HIV I mean actually decades you know and now of course like people living with HIV can have full healthy normal lives you know and that's a really, that's amazing. We've come so, so far, but it's taken so long to get there. Mm. And it's still a hugely prevalent, you know, across the world and in different communities. And I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, so watching, you know, the, the, how this pandemic has unfolded, and it's obviously it's different and it's affected people differently, but the world and the world has really, you know, found a vaccine within a year. So yeah. it's, it, it's, 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 I don't know, it's a lot, it's just, it was really shocking to me to think, yeah, that history in some ways does repeat itself, doesn't it? Oh my God, 100%. And you were talking earlier about the kind of everyday homophobia that infiltrated society at that time. Like, you know, for instance, if you went to go get a mortgage, you probably couldn't get one because you were a gay man, for instance. Living in this world today, what kind of like negativity or homophobia have you had to face personally in your own life? And what kind of, how have you navigated that neg negativity when it comes to you? For me, I mean, I, I, I definitely struggled at school. I, I was bullied at school and uh, in part for, you know, people would call me gay and a, and a perf. I wasn't out, I didn't even know I was gay, but I was very, um, I was a bit, I was quite feminine and I would wear like makeup sometimes to school on like non-uniform day. <laughs> and so I made myself a bit of a target um, without really knowing what my sexuality was or understanding why, you know, why I wanted to dress the way I wanted to dress or whatever. Um, and then when I got older, um, you know, I would have the occasional walking down the street, you know, occasional people calling out like fatty boy or whatever. And um, I, th I remember like, I would, make, I would always be really scared to like kiss in the street, like kiss a guy in front mm. of like, you know, someone in case they were walking by. And because one time I did, and um, I remember like someone like was driving by and just like screamed out the window and like threw something. <laughs> there's like an insidious like you say everyday homophobia that's so entrenched 
within us and within our society like I, I I think it's baked into us from you know the tv shows we watched from the newspapers we read the books we read the culture we live in and it all kind of adds together to make you know homophobia a thing that's that's uh, almost invisible I always think you know a lot of a lot of gay men or a lot of gay people understand kind of homophobia because they themselves have kind of not wanted you know for me I didn't want to be gay and I was quite that's my homophobia to myself, you know? I was like, almost like this homophobic gay, cause I was so, I so hated myself for being like that. And you were kind of like, why is this happening to me? And then you could kind of then almost rationalize why people were like that. And it's such a weird kind of experience that really happens in that kind of coming out and coming at one with yourself process, isn't it? That not many people actually talk about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough. I think, you know, for me, I came out to myself and to my friends and my family, my mum when I was about 19. Mm. But it's, it's, it's taken me, you know, I'm still figuring out how to feel, <laughs> you know, comfortable and or truthful or whatever it is. But, it, it, but I think, because once you come out, it's like, okay, well, that doesn't undo all the, um, the, all, the way that you feel about that word gay or that, that, mm. that sexuality or that identity, you know, you, it takes years to really like, to, to, to understand what it means and to mm. feel comfortable within it, you know, I, I would still, you know, like be, I can't kind of like once the, once some um, years and years, once the band kind of took off, I, I felt like I was, it kind of was a relief because I felt like people knew I was gay. Like I didn't have to sort of announce it to people, you know, which was sort of a bit of a relief. It was like, well, I'm already out to everyone now, but you know, sometimes like a taxi driver would like ask me, I, I remember a taxi driver asking me if I had a girlfriend and I didn't correct, and I was just like, no, and I didn't correct him. And I was like, this is embarrassing. Like I'm actually like a singer in a band that like, I'm I'm very gay, like I'm very open again. I'm shocked when people don't think I'm gay. But this taxi driver asked me this question and I was just too, I was embarrassed. I was just like, no, I don't have a girlfriend. I didn't say anything. And then I yeah. felt really, I felt ashamed about that. And then the next time it happened, I like was like, no, I'm gay. And it was like, I felt like a little bit nervous, you know, just telling this random dude that I was gay. And I was like, how stupid, you know, it's so silly that I still feel like this, but it's just, you can't get, you can't, you can't just get rid of the way, I don't know. How do you feel? How do you feel about that stuff uh, now? I feel like I had a couple of discussions with a lot of people about this recently, actually. I was talking to Ariana DeBose, you know, who's in the prom and I was talking to her about it. And she said that she constantly feels like every single day she's coming out in some way. So she's literally, it's a never ending process because also one of the things that's so tricky still now is there isn't necessarily this like spectrum grace within the LGBTQ plus community and everyone needs, that's one of the issues I think there still is because we're still having to come out to each other and learning how to respect each other underneath this umbrella whilst also then trying to get society to respect us in the way that we should be as well. And I think that's a whole, other dynamic to it as well. Do you think that's quite prevalent too? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. In fact, I, I think the community, as a community, as a you know the queer community, we we're a real mix of so many different identities, mm. aren't we? And so many different communities. I mean, the word the, calling it a community is quite is 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 almost problematic because I feel that we are one and that are you know we uplift each other and that's what I love about being part of the community and 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 learning about other people's experiences but I think it's difficult like you say because it feels like unstable ground all the time and people are kind of getting to grips with maybe one part of an identity but not another and then they don't want to hear it and, th and it's like th that conflicts with with my rights and my values but, but but I disagree you know I think that it, it doesn't and there has to be a place where we can all get to you know something that's like equality or better than what we have now and it, it doesn't it doesn't conflict with anyone else's rights right like I think for the main ma mainly now is like I, I see a lot of you know hatred and and fear and craziness mm. directed at trans people and I think it feels like an evolution of homophobia um it feels very close and and I and I you know that's that worries me a lot yeah I think that's what's so scary about it because we all just need to come together in this moment especially when we're more divided than ever we're sitting in our homes on our own mostly or in a bubble or like and we're so we're so spread out but there is still this community out there you've just got to get out there and find it and find your people right that's the most special thing and I think one of the things that's so amazing about it's a sin as well is it actually 
really goes into kind of like the mental health implications around sexuality in general, but also obviously HIV and AIDS and dealing with that. How have you learned to deal with and manage your own mental health, would you say? And how have you learned to look after it? Well, I can tell you, I have like, I have like basically a list of things that I do. So it's like, some of them are like really, are like big ones. Like I take, I take antidepressants still. I've taken them for like 10 years and it's a, I call it an antidepressant. I mean, it's an SSRI, which is a type of antidepressant. Um, and I find that really helpful. And it's taken me like years to get the right dose, the right drug, but you know, I've seen so many different doctors, but I think I've found what works for me now. And I still Skype, Skype my therapist <laughs> once a week. <laughs> so I have like those two, those are like two really big things. I'm not saying that everyone needs, they absolutely don't need those things, but that's, that, that's what I, I use. I have a diary, like in a journal. So I write down my feelings <laughs> a lot. Um, which I've always done that, I've kept one since I was 13 and it's just really, it's, that's really helped me. And like all the advice I've gotten from people is they always say like, it's good to write your thoughts down, you know, it's good mm. to have, you know, like when, you, when you're feeling something like send someone a letter, but don't send it, just write it. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's- My notes are I, full of stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talking about the show, like my character, Richie, like he's very, he has a lot of kind of fear and he doesn't mm. want to acknowledge that he's kind of struggling and um for me like I had to learn that lesson a bit in my life I had to kind of acknowledge that I need, I need help and, and and it's okay to ask for support and it's okay to lean on your friends and like because I'm one of those people that I like to be happy fun ollie all the time you know with my friends but um when actually just being able to say you know oh I, I feel a bit upset about this or I need to talk about this or you know, it's so simple, but it took me a long time to do. And it's that, and that really helps, helps me as well. Because it's almost like that idea, I feel very similar to that in the sense of, you always want to play up to being this fun person, right? And you want to be like, I'm the larger life person. I'm always really cheery, but that can also be very damaging as well, can't it? Yeah, I think a lot of queer people relate to this because they're used to kind of being on a mask or, you know, appearing some certain way. And like, I mean, me, this is a story. I mean, that's very much like I relate to that myself because I, I do it for a living. You know, I go on stage mm -hmm. and, you know, do this. And um, I love it. I find a lot, you know, I get a lot of strength from that. But it's also, um, it can be exhausting. It can be like, you're always trying to play a character. You're never authentically yourself. You know, if you can't, and if you don't get, you know, if you're always doing that, I think you feel a bit kind of, broken <laughs> yeah. and it's exhausting it? and I think it's also so important that we get to this point where someone can say oh I take antidepressants I go to therapy and it's just accepted and it's like that's a really important thing as well isn't it yeah totally you're so right and I think I'm glad you say that because sometimes I think like is it okay for me to even just like keep but of course it's okay but I still I still have it myself I'm like is it okay for me to share that I take antidepressants? And do, I mean, I, of course I want to. And like, I think you're right. Like we're in a place now where, it's the, where, where, you know, people can have a conversation about the mental health like this and it's respected. And like, that's amazing, you know, mm. I think. And I think what's so powerful about It's a Sin as well, and you've been talking about this is the idea of friendship. And there is this friendship element to it, which is so important and so powerful. But if there was a time in your life where you could go back and be a friend to yourself, when would it have been? And what would you say to that, Ollie? So my younger self, I would probably go, I, I, I would go back to myself at primary school because I was just very unhappy at primary school, if I'm honest. Like my last year at primary school, I was just so miserable. I just remember being so miserable and that kind of like carried on to my first couple of years of secondary school. And I would go back and I would just say, you know what, Ollie, I don't know if he would be able to hear this. So I might just like, do you know what? I would just be like, let's chill. I'm going to hang out with you. Let's watch some cartoons. Like I'm here to be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> but if I could say something to him and he would listen, I would be like, all that stuff that you think is wrong about yourself, like, because you know, the ways in which you think you're faulty or wrong, um, just chill because that's going to really be good for you in the end. That's going to, well, it's going to be your strength and it's going to make you special. So try not to get too down about that stuff <laughs> like it's gonna it gets better yeah um, 
I guess I would do that. Do you think you're kind of doing this and, you know, when you go out on stage, you're living your best life and, you know, you're at Glastonbury doing this incredible things and, you know, being in amazing TV shows like It's Sin, are you kind of doing it for that person in a way? Yes, exactly. Yes, 100%. That's what I was going to say. I was going to be like, I'm kind of like, I actually think this sometimes that I'm kind of like, if time travel was real, like maybe, you know, like, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Like, in, because I feel like I'm going back in time to my younger self and being like, hey, you can do this. Cause, cause I have a lot, you know, if I'm like, oh, I'm really scared, or I can't do this. I'll think about my younger self and go, okay, well, you can do it, you know? I think that all the time. We've all got to be doing it for our younger selves, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, keep doing it. Keep going out there and shining because we need it. So, and congrats. It's just it's amazing. So it's been amazing talking to you, Ollie. So stay safe. You too. Stay Navigate safe. lockdown 3.0. We've got this. We've got this. And speak to you super soon. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, thank you. Bye. Okay, I'm gonna go. Bye. Bye.